little bit of bias as I make a lot of Google TV apps and Google apps. Um, for me, uh, TV apps are like really super interesting because it seems to me like it's the next stage of like bringing it all together, like bringing it together our connected society. Because at first, like the internet was bringing like it was giving you access to like all the niches of the world were becoming connected together through a conversation. It, you, it wasn't like just sending letters anymore. You had the sense of the communication, and then. That became a little bit more personal uh, when when it could go around with you everywhere. And now we we have this kind of like hyper local, hyper local um, environment where you can share in things with people in a small context like this. This can this particular physical instance where we are all sharing, but you can all be connected to something and uh, appreciated as a greater whole, which is really interesting. And and so. Um, I'm really excited to explore that. Uh, with us, we have some guys from Google TV who are going to be taking us through the motions. Um, so please take it away. Hi. Um, yeah, so um, I'm Christian Kortsky. I'm a developer advocate for Google TV. I'll be up a little bit later. And uh, we actually split it in four major sections. And I let uh, yeah. Osama kick it off. Is this working? Oh, it is. Good. Hi guys, uh, my name is Osama Alami. I manage our developer relations team for Google TV. Uh, both Christian and I are visiting from uh, California. Uh, so we're very excited to be here. Um, so as he said, we're going to split it in since, uh, since we're going to be up here for about an hour and 45 minutes. Um, I do want to do some talks and then spend some time working with any of you if you uh, have uh, questions. Uh, so we're going to split it into sort of four sessions. I'm going to do a quick introduction to Google TV. How many of you uh, have actually played or seen uh, with, uh, Google TV? We're good. All right. Uh, it's about, I don't know, six people or so. Uh, then Christian's going to talk about user experience design for TV, uh, which is uh, uh, applicable across a, a variety of TV, smart TV platforms. Uh, and then I'll talk about video delivery and monetization. And then Christian will take you through the motions of what it takes to build an application, taking it from your IDE straight to the Play Store. So to dive right into the introduction, uh, we do have a Google TV uh, box set up here to this, this TV. Uh, but uh, TV, what we aim Google TV to be is an integration of uh, the web, of applications and of TV itself. Uh, so in terms of the, the technical platform itself, it's, it is an operating system. Uh, a lot of people ask me, you know, oh, you work on Google TV, where can I download that? Uh, it is actually an operating system and it comes on several different devices. Uh, it is based on Android Honeycomb, uh, that's Android 3.2, and it comes with a full desktop Chrome browser. Uh, but linear TV remains sort of at the center of the experience. Uh, I don't have a live TV feed hooked up to this TV right here, but uh, TV would show up in the, the background here of this, the, what we call the home bar. So uh, with, with Google TV, there are really two different ways that you as a developer can approach it. There is building an application for the Google Play Store, formerly Android Market, or uh, build a web application uh, optimized for TV for the desktop Chrome browser. We have a couple of, uh, so the Generation 1 devices were launched in the United States. This is a remote control for the Generation 1 Sony device. Um, it, it does sort of look like a, a, a game controller. Uh, there's also a Generation 1 device from Logitech, and their remote's quite large. Uh, so uh, both ourselves and our OEMs sort of took a lot of feedback from our Generation 1 product and iterated on it. Uh, so you can see the new remotes um, down in the corner there are much more of the candy bar uh, style TV remote that, that users are going to be much more familiar with. They're much, simpl uh, much uh, simplified. Uh, they still have a full, full keyboard if you flip them over. Uh, and these are the two devices that uh, Sony is launching. Uh, we also have devices with some other OEMs launching. 
So uh, we iterated on the hardware. We also iterated greatly on the software. Uh, we took a lot of feedback from our generation one product and heard loud and clear that it needed to be much simpler to use, uh, that users were, were generally confused by it, and it wasn't uh, an enjoyable experience. So we greatly simplified V2. Um, I'll actually do the demo over here since I do have a TV hooked up. Uh, there is this simplified UI where a user pressing the home button, uh, they'll, they'll typically see live TV in the background, uh, will come to our home screen, shows the time. Uh, the next thing to the right of it is our alerts uh, framework, which is if you're familiar with an Android phone, is the same sort of alert system that Android has. It's just less intrusive because uh, obviously we don't want to interrupt the TV watching experience too much. Then there's access to the all apps. Uh, everything is now listed in this all app screen. Uh, users uh, can download new apps in the Play Store, or if they bookmark applications from Google Chrome, it'll show up in, in all apps. Uh, the rest of this bar here is customizable by the user. Uh, I have access to the live TV player here, uh, YouTube app, uh, Chrome, Search, which is also accessible via a key on the keyboard, and then Google Play. But uh, the user can place anything they want in, in this, this section here, and there's, there's two more sections uh, to the right of the Play Store. The Chrome web browser hasn't actually changed uh, significantly from version one. Uh, it's a pretty standard Chrome experience. Just enter a URL and go. Uh, Obviously, this, this site's not optimized for TV, but uh, a lot of uh, developers have optimized their websites for TV, uh, made it navigable via the D-pad and such. And then, last but certainly not least, uh, with our Generation 2 uh, software, we brought Google Play to TV. Uh, the network is a little slow. There we go. So this is uh, you know, one important distinction is that there is one Play Store. Uh, so across mobile, tablet, and TV, it's one Google Play Store. Uh, the TV will only display applications that will run on its hardware. The key distinction being that a TV doesn't support a touchscreen. Uh, long are the days where we needed to get up from the couch and head over to the TV to interact with it. So Android, uh, Google, the Google Play Store assumes that any application uploaded to it will uh, requires a touchscreen unless it says explicitly that it doesn't. So of the hundreds of thousands of applications that show up on uh, Android mobile devices, there's about two to 3,000 that show up on the Play Store on TV. And of those, really about 150 have been optimized for TV specifically. So we have the hero banner up top, which is a rotating set of applications that we feature, uh, that we highlight here. Uh, we have the featured for TV section, uh, which is another set of featured applications that we rotate. And then a uh, user can go to view all and see sort of the universe of applications that we're currently featuring. And then they can also browse all apps and all games and search across uh, Google Play. So I showed you these screenshots. So where do you, um, hopefully as a developer, come in? Uh, again, the opportunities are to build a Android application, a native application, and distribute it through the Google Play Store, to build a web application accessible through Chrome, uh, to, or to build a multi-screen experience. Uh, so to build a tablet or phone app that is a companion to your TV app uh, that lets the user sort of interact on multiple screens. Um, I think there's a lot of potential in this area. Uh, we've seen some, some great, great applications. For example, uh, uh, an app called Poker Fun that um, is a, a poker playing game and the TV becomes the playing table and each user's phone becomes their, uh, d their hand of cards. Uh, we've also seen some pretty fun remote control applications. Uh, Google TV ships with this uh, any mode protocol, which lets you write applications that, um, where any device on the same local network can control the TV. 
And then through Google Play, you have the opportunity to promote, uh, distribute, and monetize your application. Uh, you can obviously make it available for free. You can sell your application. You can uh, monetize with in-app purchasing. All the features that you have on uh, the Google Play Store on mobile devices, you have on the TV. So any advertising SDK, uh, either from Google or from a third party, uh, that works on Android will work on a Google TV application as well. Uh, so the other uh, option there is to, is to advertise. So uh, getting started, uh, Christian is going to go into further detail on uh, the technical specifics, but uh, if you are interested in getting started, we have documentation available on developers.google.com slash TV to either build an Android application or optimize a website or build a multi-screen application. Uh, and if you're a publisher and interested in learning, about, uh, learning more, you can go to googletv.com slash publisher. Highlight this one one more time. I will take questions now, and I'll ask Christian to come up uh, so he can prep his next talk. Any questions? Oh, there you go. Sorry? Uh, the question is, how do you get your application featured? Uh, so. I'm going to give a talk on video delivery and monetization. I'll talk about how, to, how we feature applications. Generally, it is uh, build a great application. Uh, build an application that makes sense for TV, that has a good UI, that performs quickly, that has great content, um, and then make it available through Google Play, and typically we'll feature it. Um, good morning. Yep. The Google Workshop in the TV app is now opening. Uh, the question is, was, is there any access to the TV feed? Uh, currently, no. There is no way for an application to overlay over the TV feed or to uh, control the TV feed other than change channels. An application can change channels. Has anyone got any questions? I've got a microphone. It'll be easier. Any questions? Here we go. I, I might have missed this earlier, but do you know roughly what the installed base of Google TV devices is currently? Uh, we're, we're not sharing that, those numbers. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, kind of DRM you are going to support as a uh, connected DRM for, for the Google TV. Is it Widevine or is it? Yeah, we something have else? we have support for Widevine currently. And uh, secure media is dropped. Uh, what's? I'm I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, yeah. You acquired, you purchased Motorola as well with the secure media company, and so the question is uh, if you are going to continue also support secure media the ERM uh, uh, side of Widevine. I, I I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Okay. I'll turn it over to Christian. Um, he'll do about 20 minutes on UI design for Google TV, and then we'll, um, we'll do another Q&A session. Okay. Thank you, Osama. Okay. So, people, you can, there's more seats in here. These blue things, you can sit on them as well, rather than just hover around them. It's okay. So, so we've got a big crowd at the back. People feel free to come and sit around here. These big, big bags as well are really good to sit on. So can I see some more hands? Like who are developers in the audience here? Got developers at the back here. You guys are going to be staying a while, so please come in, come in, come in. <laughs> How about business owners? Have we got business owners here? Business owner over there. People that work in content. Is there, are there lots of people here working in content? Over there. Great. Okay. 
So, Christian? All right. Uh, let me just double check. I know what time I'm supposed to end here. So, I have plenty of time. We're ahead of schedule. This is awesome. So, I might actually even tell a few jokes on the way. So, come on in. It's going to get good. Um, so, my name is Christian Kortske. I am a developer advocate in the Mountain View team um, for Google TV. Let's see if you can all hear me here. So, here is a little plug for our developer website. So, if I'll, I'll talk mostly about developer stuff. So, I assume most of you are interested in developers. So, you can go to our developer.google.com slash TV. And you can find a lot of interesting information above and beyond what we already have for Android. And uh, if you're not coder and you're more familiar with like the Photoshop kind of tools, which there's nothing wrong with it, um, you can go to our GTV Android patterns. So I'm going to be talking about UI design. And I don't even pretend to be a UI designer. Um, but I've seen a lot of interesting UI design over the last year. As Osama pointed out, one of the core focuses of our uh, development team was really to get our UI into the 21st century and make it really cool and make it appropriate for a television. So um, the question that I always get from coders is, why on earth would I care about the user interface? Um, that's usually the last thing you worry about. The reason you should care about your UI is, Television, you, television viewers have an incredibly unrealistic expectation or unrealistically high expectation on user interface. And I blame all the broadcasters. They have a whole staff of people who do nothing else than make stuff look beautiful on television. So if you just switch channel and there has been this game show where like 3D letters are flying around the screen and the answers are popping up and you have like overlays and all kinds of stuff. And then the users come to your app, and your app looks like something from a command line terminal from a, like VT100, then there is a little bit of a disconnect. So make sure your app on a television looks really polished. On a telephone screen, people sort of put up with you know, command line looking apps. There is like great checkboxes and things. On a TV, if it doesn't have a really polished look and feel, people perceive your app as not as high quality. So you want to have a high perceived quality, which leads to better ratings, which typically in the market also gets your app up on top. And I think there was a question earlier, what do I do to make my app featured? Well, the best way is if it looks absolutely beautiful and it also works, then you really have high chances for good rating, which gets you more installs. And ultimately, what everybody always wants is it also gets you more profit. So better UI, more profit. So when you design on a television, the first thing that I have to sort of remind people of, know your audience. Know who is going to use your app. And we all have a tendency when we develop apps, we develop them for primarily ourselves and for friends and family and people we know. And it's usually the hip crowd, and they know how to use the internet. They know how to use apps, how to handle multitasking on a device. But we forget that most television is also watched by people who are not necessarily your early adopters. Um, what I like to point out is if you develop a smartphone app in Android, you can assume that your app user has put down a bunch of money, purchased the top of the line phone in the store, and let's just say they have a natural curiosity to explore your app. And they're not easily scared. On television, usually one or two people in the family are the early adopters. They drive the purchase of, a, say, Google TV device or of a connected TV device. But then you have your in-laws come over. You have your buddies come over on the weekend. If the TV is sort of scary and your app is hard to use, um, your TV will end up out of the living room, somewhere in the office, somewhere in the den, somewhere in the kids' room. So you want to make sure your app is really easily approachable. And one of my advices is, if your app needs complex instructions, uh, you're doing it wrong. In fact, I want to emphasize, if you need any instructions, you're doing it wrong. So as an app developer, it's very tempting to put a lot of features, a lot of functionality in your app. Um, I have recently reviewed an app that seriously tried to 
put like command control sequences on the screen. It's like, okay, control S is whatever, sh change screens or something. It's like, what the hell are you thinking? Um, your users will figure out the more advanced stuff later, but make it easy for people to at least get started. Um, once they're hooked on your app, they'll sort of explore around with, and the power users will feature or will figure out the more advanced features in your app. So with that, let's, let's look how people interact with TVs. Um, as Osama pointed out, this is sort of the generation one device. For the next generation of hardware, the OEMs have really done a lot of work making the user interface more living room-like. Um, I have actually received an email from somebody who was sad that the Logitech remote is not supported for the Gen 2. Um, having a big keyboard in the living room is fun for, for me and for nerds and stuff, but for normal people, they want something that looks like a TV remote. So the primary mechanism how people interact with Google TV is in fact what we call the D-pad. It's up, down, left, right. Conveniently, also what I have on this thing here. So when you develop your app, make sure there is a way for a user to use your app with just four keys, which is actually a challenge. A lot of Android developers, they always assume there is a touch input. When you design an app, you implicitly rely on things like, okay, you can touch random things on the screen. And I'll talk a, bit, a little bit about it later, why this assumption is sometimes leading to poor usability with a D-pad. An alternative input mechanism is also the IP remote, or it basically is a cell phone app. We've published a reference implementation as open source. So if you are interested as developers, you can actually download the code for the app. Um, it's available, the app itself is available for iPhone and for Android. It combines basically all the features that you have on a regular keyboard remote or a regular one of those remotes and it makes it available on your cell phone. We've had one developer who really enjoyed making a, a much better version of it and a much more usable version of it. So there is a lot of innovation going on right now with the input devices. But one of the things I want to highlight is, as a, as a developer, I mean, you have a lot of opportunity. There is a lot of connected devices in a home right now especially a lot of the early adopters slash power users. They really have tablets, they have cell phones. Um, try to think of apps that can leverage all those different input devices. And we've seen some really cool applications already. Um, I think Osama pointed out there is a poker game um, where basically you have your poker cards on your personal device and you use the TV as a shared social space, <coughs> social space where you can um, distribute the cards on the card table. There is a lot of other ideas and a lot of other things you can think of. And we really think um, this is not the easiest way to develop an app that's connected across screens, but it's definitely one of the most challenging and probably the one of the most interesting where you really get a wow factor from your audience. So now let's look at UI guidelines. And as I said, those are guidelines, really. If you have a UI team who knows what they're doing, feel free to ignore me. But um, this is at least gets you to a reasonably good shape. First, when I talk to developers, I want to remind them what a television is. Um, and it sounds ironic, but unfortunately, most of us are not traditional TV watchers. Um, there is a lot more of those than there is of us. So usually TVs are not connected to Linux boxes. They are not connected to PCs in the living room. Usually people watch linear broadcast, um, things like TV stations. And typically it's also more of a family experience. You have multiple people, which um, leads me to basically, as when you design your user interface, when you design your application, Keep in mind that unlike a cell phone, which I carry on me, it's in my pocket, I know who is using it. On a TV, I have no idea who's home right now. Um, my wife might have friends over and they might be watching TV. I don't want my Twitter notifications to show up on TV when she's watching TV with her buddies. 
So keep in mind when you design an app, it's a social environment. Um, you may want to have ways to protect privacy. So as an example, um, I worked with the Twitter guys to develop the Twitter app and we decided it's a good idea to not show direct messages on the screen. And if you have something with account management, try to think about how you use multiple accounts. So Android has an account manager. I can support multiple signed in accounts. The platform itself does not have an easy or elegant way to switch accounts right now. So as a developer, this is in your hands. So you may want to think about how you can easily switch between signed in accounts, maybe have a quick pin verification or something. Um, this is my US slides. We talk about something called a 10-foot UI. Hopefully most of you here are familiar with the term 10-foot UI. I translated it for, for Europeans. <laughs> um, but uh, joking aside, it's really um, the experience that we want to define when we have a television app. It's different from actually interacting with a computer or even with a tablet. Users usually come home from work. They are in a relaxed mood. They are sort of what we call also a lean back experience. They want to just consume content, make it easy for them to get to content fast and convenient. Um, few examples to think about is I have reviewed a couple of uh, music applications. Both uh, require the initial time when you start it up, you sign in with a user account. Obviously, when you start it the next time, you want to remember the user account. But one of them, you start it up, it immediately plays back music, preferably where you left off the last time. And then it gives you a choice to browse music library by artist and so on um, while you're listening to music. The other one, you start it up, nothing happens. It asks you what artist you're looking for, which album you're looking for. Oh, do you really want to start playing or do you want to add it to a playlist, want to create a playlist, play back the playlist? And eventually, you'll actually hear some music. Um, I leave it up to you to imagine which one has more installs and more users. The other thing is, um, for example, imagine a YouTube application where you have typically two minute or three minute cat, uh, like video clips of kittens playing with balls in living rooms. Um, once the user has finished playing the video clip in a living room, they don't really want to click a mouse and you know, interact with it again. They may be doing dishes, they may be doing laundry, they are not sitting in front waiting, okay, what's next? So whenever the video clip ends, just pick one and play the next one. Make it sort of a continuous playback experience. I think I don't have the numbers in this slides, but usually what I like to remind people of is in the US, I think it's five hours a day. I think in Europe, it's about four hours a day that people watch television. There is another 19 hours or 20 hours that you can run your app on TV. I like when people ask me, what should I go after? Should I go after the four hours or the 20 hours? I'm like, if I want to have one hour of app engagement time, I rather aim for the other 20 hours. So create the next killer app that really runs while people are having breakfast or dinner or something. The other things to keep in mind for an app design is TVs have high quality sound. That is an opportunity. It's also something to keep in mind. Mute your volume. Um, don't blast your like keyboard notifications at full volume. And also keep it simple. That's sort of my theme throughout the presentation is really Make the app approachable, make it simple. Um, keep the navigation pretty flat. Um, the other just general good ideas, um, this is not a TV app. Um, don't use white background. Uh, imagine the usual TV sits in the living room. It's 10 o'clock at night. The lights are dimmed. You have a full screen white, 60 inches. Um, yeah, simplify, simplify. When you navigate, I'll get into this later, uh, make sure there is a focus that's distinct and easily identifiable. And animations are usually really cool. Users really want to see stuff moving around a TV screen. Usually when stuff stops moving, it means the app has crashed. So keep things moving around. 
in general, yes, Google TV is an Android device. You can just upload your Android app and as a developer there's a good chance you'll figure out quickly how to get it work. But it's not just a big screen Android device. Um, really think about what is unique about a television, how it sits in the living room. Focus on the vital parts, simplify, make it easy, group stuff together. One of my, so it's always tempting. I have a 60 inch screen. Oh my God, I can put so many buttons on there and menus and things to click. Um, don't fill up the entire space. Keep keep the, only the vital information and let users drill deeper into your app, go from screen to screen. I hate scrolling. Um, don't scroll on a television. Um, rather, switch between screens as you go progressively deeper into the app. Um, don't overload the users. They really don't want to feel stupid in their own living room. Um, if a user can't figure out your app, they'll, use it, they'll usually be frustrated and go somewhere else. Um, just from a technical point of view, design layouts which scale, and um, there's reasons for that. Overscan, you all know about different screen sizes. Um, and make it, I mean, make use of nine patch images. It's a great Android tool. Um, for those of you who don't know nine patches, it's basically a way to design beautiful, scalable buttons which adapt to different screen sizes. Keep it simple, um, hire somebody who does that for a living. Um, usually when I have the two Android developers in the garage, they know how to use Photoshop or GIMP or Microsoft Paint. Um, you're not a graphics designer. You wouldn't let your graphics designer write code. Why do you think you can do graphics design? In general, if your app looks like this, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> so my advice is, first of all, dark background. Looks nice in the living room. Animations, eye candy, bold fonts, short lines, increased line spacing. This is really sort of, this font size is convenient in the living room. Um, on tablets, people read books, people read paragraphs and paragraphs of text on a television. Nobody wants to really read from one end of the screen to the other end of the screen. If you watch a newscast, if you watch sports, there is usually four or five words of text. Um, you don't watch an entire SEC filing document on your TV. Just give me the stock price. Is it up? Is it down? I don't care anything else. If I want to read the background information, I'm a lot more likely to open up my laptop and read more about it online. Which gets me to information density. So imagine TV sort of in relation to a phone and a tablet. I, I frequently get people who have a phone app, people who have a tablet app, and they're like, which one should I use to start from my TV experience? Most people think TVs are bigger and better, so let's start from a tablet and add even more. I like to point out that the amount of information I like on a television is usually a little bit more than my phone, but not much. The, the tablet is definitely more information than I can handle on my TV. Um, also, in relation, one of the things to keep in mind, after, at this point, usually people think, okay, I should make it polished, I should have a really cool screen. So the easiest way to get a really cool look and feel is have your graphics designer give you a full screen background image and just put it in the background. Great on a phone, uh, full screen background is about one and a half megabytes. On a tablet, we're talking four megabytes. On a 1080p television, you have eight megabytes of your background. So keep that in mind. When you design backgrounds, um, make sure you reuse them across your app. If you have four or five different background screens, you're running up a lot of memory at runtime and also in packaging. So let's talk about TV specific stuff. So as I mentioned, um, first of all, I'm not a graphics designer, but um, this is sort of a sample app that we published. And what you see here is we have focus selection, we have focus highlights. Um, those are some of the states that you need in your application. If this was a tablet app, I wouldn't need a focus highlight or anything. I just touch one of the thumbnails and automatically it would play back this video. 
um, using the keyboard or using my D-pad to navigate, I sort of need to highlight focus here. So basically, picture a user traversing through the focus elements. Um, one of the things I usually always joke about is the difference between the way we as humans see the world and computers see the world. So as a human, if I have a focus grid layout, something like this, and my focus is right here, and I press the down arrow on my D-pad, what do you think should happen? Well, I'm looking right here, I think my focus should go down here. Now, if a computer looks at this layout, the logical conclusion is, you're here, you want to go down. Oh, I have a solution. This is right here. So this is the next one down. Um, this is not a good navigation scheme. It's like, at this point, the focus jumps across the screen. Users are confused. The other option is, oh, I want to go down. Let's go here. That's a bad choice, too. So Android does have a default focus handling. And by default, it depends on how your layouts are cascaded, how you basically box together your XML files. One of the three things will happen. Only one of them is desirable. So if you want to have a great application, you want to make sure that the Android system understands what you want to do. And you want to explicitly define what should happen next. So Android gives you a couple of really cool UIs for that. There is the focus um, selection and the focus drawables. So you can, you can actually define, let me see. I'm missing a slide, never mind. So there is focus down, focus next, and so on, that you can define where your focus should go. And then also, when you declare your uh, custom drawables, make sure you have all three states. Most developers create a focus state. They create a selected state. But sometimes they forget the focus and selected. And that's when basically the focus moves over the current selection. And then it sometimes disappears, which is confusing. Um, here is a very simple example of a good and a bad layout. So let me explain, explain the good one first. So this is what I would like to see on a television, where basically you have the high-level choices on the left side. You have, say, a list of contacts in the middle. So this could be personal friends, work friends, I don't know, school friends. You have a list of friends in the middle. And then you have send email, send SMS, or something on this side. So you can navigate from here to here with one click. You can scroll up and down the list, select a few. And then with one right click, you go over to the side. Unfortunately, most apps look like this. So in this scenario, you select your whatever work friends on top. You scroll through the list. And now in order to get down here, you have to scroll through the entire list of friends. This is really usable on a tablet or a phone, where people can just swipe through here, select a few items, and then they just press the button on the bottom. This is tempting to just take as it is for television. But it will be a pretty poor choice when you do user trials. You'll see it takes like 40, 50 clicks for people to get through here. The bad thing is you'll never notice, because when you do your own development, you'll usually just have two or three friends in your list, and that's useful. But then the first time you run it for somebody in the real world with 200 friends, they get really frustrated to get down here. So a couple other UI ideas or UI paradigms is <clears throat> Android apps for tablets frequently use the, what we call the action bar. It was introduced with Honeycomb. Um, as a user, you should have seen it anytime you use an Android app on a, ta on a tablet. As a developer, you should be familiar with the APIs. It's a very convenient API. It has things like navigation, action items, and so on. What we have done is, for Google TV, we have basically taken the exact same API. And instead of having an action bar on top, we have a left-hand navigation bar on the side. It does exactly the same thing as an action bar. And it has the same APIs. And we made it available as a library. So you as developer can just download it, either the source code or the binary, and just add it to your app. We have um, three different states. So the first state here was just the icons. 
The next state is the expanded icons when it has focus and it just overlays over the background or it's the fully expanded and the background shifts over. So I can show it to you on the TV here in the real world. Basically, we use it, for example, for our Photos app. Where is our Photos app? There we go. So we have the action bar on the side. And yeah, right now nothing is selected. But it has the same API. It has the same API as the um, action bar in an Android tablet application. So another thing that, well, I can actually also show live here is the notification framework. So as Osama pointed out, we do have a similar mechanism to, for example, notifications in standard Android. So if you have an Android phone and you have incoming email or you have SMS messages or something, there's going to be an, a notification bar on top. With Google TV, those notifications go into the little notification box here. I can select it and it will tell me there's updates available. On my slides here, you can see as a developer, you can also have custom notification with custom images and so on and so forth. So you can get pretty fancy as an app developer. So this is a really good way for your app to inform the user that something new and exciting is going on. And then when you click on the app, um, it will actually just open up the new, or it will open up a, your own app and you can do whatever you want from there. Lastly, in order to be really unique and beautiful, um, mind your topography. Uh, there is, there's a lot of expectation on television. Um, just the Helvetica 10-point font is not necessarily the best choice. So do something that's really unique, um, matches your brand. Use color. Um, empty space is also a nice color. So use alpha blending, maybe let the background shine through. Um, don't put too much stuff on the screen. Um, empty space is my favorite space on television. Um, don't, as I said, I mean, don't make it look like it's space control. It's not launching the space shuttle. Um, there is, sometimes your app needs a lot of information. Um, let me see, there is one app where we have a lot of stuff going on on the screen. I'll just highlight that. So I fought a long and hard battle about this application. Um, there is this screen here, which I think has way too much information. But for the actual real sports enthusiast, well, once we get to the network, it shows basically all the basketball games of the year and all the standings. It's, it's a lot of information. It's really cool if you need it, but uh, it, this, this is not what I think the default experience. It's one thing, basically, as I said earlier, ignore my guidelines whenever you know what you're doing. But I think this is a great dashboard. Like if you're watching TV, maybe go back to it, um, see how all the other teams are doing. But normally, keep your TV screens a little bit lighter. Um, don't put too much information on it. Um, one of the apps that I work with, I think, that does it really well is the CNBC app. They have basically just use a large screen for videos. Oh. Great. <laughs> Normally, it gets an IP stream if I have network. Anyways, um, the other thing is use motion, use transitions. Um, with Google TV, in the, in the new version here, with version 2, we also have hardware acceleration. So you can use a lot of alpha transitions or you can use the uh, Android animation framework where you can go from one activity to the next one. You can scaling transition. You can use um, all the basic Android transitions. If you are really um, hardcore developers, you can create your own in OpenGL or RenderScript. There is a lot of eye candy you can add. I don't want to pretend it's easy, but um, it looks really cool when you're done with it. So the other advice is um, really take advantage when you go through all the hassle of creating an Android application. 
at least you know, make it look like one, reuse the UI framework wherever it works, make it look like it really blends in, it feels at home on the TV. My biggest advice is please don't screw up the back button. Um, people are very used to back taking them to a useful place. So if you have a long and deep menu hierarchy, and I said earlier, I really like it when you have progressive dialogues and it goes deeper and deeper. Don't make the user step back one by one. Maybe the back button should take you actually home to your sort of launch panel. And again, ignore me when you know what you're doing, but the average user should not build their own list, menus, sliders, preferences, checkboxes, and so on. Um, we put a lot of UI research into making ours look native and look beautiful. Um, if you know what you're doing and you have your own brand reasons, feel free to skin them. But for the average user, I think the system defaults. First of all, they make the user feel at home. They know the app. They feel they're familiar with it. And it also looks more beautiful than if you have pieced together and every application has their own different skinning. Um, nope, we've done that. Speaking of back button, I hit that accidentally. So yeah, um, lastly, even if you have a really beautiful UI, um, if your app is not responsive and it's not fast, you're really doing it wrong. So please don't do any UI on the, uh, any IO on the UI thread. As a developer, it sometimes is convenient to just load thumbnails from the network or load any graphics assets from the network when you need them. Um, it really is a bad idea. It works on your desk in the office when your backend server is just around the hallway. Um, it will not work on a home network connection, and it sure as hell won't work here with all the other people on the same network. Don't do any computing. Um, for development, use strict mode. This is a great tool. When you turn on strict mode in your application, it will actually warn you every time you do something like UI thread um, blocking. Learn about how to use async task and intent service. Those are really great tools in Android to asynchronously load in stuff in the background. And lastly, test, debug, profile, and use trace view. Because the last thing you want is something like that on your screen. If Android shows the application not responding dialog, your users are typically unhappy. So I'll leave that up for now. The best way to get a hold of us is um, you can ask technical questions on Stack Overflow. I very much encourage you to go there um, for technical information. We have a Twitter feed. We also have our own Google Groups. And then lastly, we have sample code. So the best way to learn a new framework or the best way to learn a new product is always just go look at the sample code, compile it. So with that. Just in time, a few more questions. Hi, uh, can you get things like uh, Wi-Fi location and um, any other peripheral type of, oh, no, obviously a compass, but mm. uh, <laughs> not, but um, can you get a Wi-Fi location on it? Uh, no. So right now, so I can only speak about the launch product that we have in the US. So typically what we do there is when you set up your TV, you enter a postal code or a zip code, and an application can retrieve the location information based on the zip code. So that gives you at least, I want to say, enough accuracy for something like local news, local weather. Um, we don't have any more accurate locations, so we don't have GPS, obviously, and we don't do Wi-Fi triangulation or any of those things. Any other questions? Questions? Yeah, uh, does the, uh, that's the second generation of the Google TVs. Yes. Uh, do you support uh, stuff like no. micro microphones? OK, so it's the first generation hardware, but it's running the Honeycomb version of the software. Okay. So, so does the second one support the microphone, if you have a supporting TV or something? So some OEMs have included microphones in their remote control. Um, for example, the Sony remote has a microphone. Um, 
I'm not 100% sure how it's exposed API-wise. So we, it's not mandat mandatory, so not every Google TV will have a microphone. Um, we'll have to see how Sony is exposing their microphone APIs. Some more questions? No? OK, so I'll hand it back over to Osama. Oh, more questions. Um, I was thinking about doing an app where two people can play a game with two different remotes. Mm -hmm. Would that be possible? Like they they each pressing a, um, the same button or a different button? So right now, the hardware only supports one remote control per Google TV device. But we definitely have games where people have paired multiple smartphones. and. One, one example is the poker game, so you can have, I think, up to four people in a room with smartphones playing on a single TV. Or um, we also have, uh, I think it's a drawing game, it's like a Pictionary where you can draw pictures and guess who is drawing what. So we've seen people use smartphones for that input. So, so when you say pairing, is that, how do you pair with, with the, the, the Google TV? So the remote control has a pairing protocol and we use basically pin codes where you enter a pin code. It's a little bit tricky to establish the relationship because also you can't always rely on the fact that a cell phone is paired to the local Wi-Fi network, the same Wi-Fi network as your Google television. Um, if they are, we do support uh, MDNS discovery. Um, what I would recommend is I've seen people use, for example, QR codes and go through a common server backend for the pairing. That's really the most robust pairing. And then I've seen, for example, the poker guys uh, or the, the drawing game guys, they always go through the same backend because you know everybody can reach the internet from the TV or from their smartphone. Do you know the name of the poker game? It's. Uh, <laughs> Poker fun. Poker fun. Game. Yes. Okay, we'll and check that out. Mobile. Great. And the other one is We Draw. We Draw. Great, okay. And there's another question. Got time for another question? Yeah. We okay, got time. Cool. Oh, it's. Uh, oh, that. <laughs> Related to the, uh, the same last question, the Bluetooth on board, could you use Bluetooth uh, to detect presence of uh, ancillary devices, you know, pa pair devices to work those sorts of things out? Would that work? So the Generation 1 Sony device does not have Bluetooth today. Um, the next generation devices, uh, at least the Sony device I know, will have Bluetooth. Um, I am not 100% sure about other OEMs. So Bluetooth is not a mandatory feature, it's optional. If you have Bluetooth, then using Bluetooth is a really nice, convenient way to do that. Any other questions? Yeah? Okay, sure. Can you do uh, internet calling? Uh, do Google TVs come with a SIP stack? Or so the question was uh, IP calling over SIP stack. Um, as far as I know, we don't have a SIP stack on board. Also, keep in mind, uh, Google TV devices, the current devices in the market, don't have microphones. Um, and they also don't support connecting external like web cameras or USB microphone accessories. Anybody else? Any other questions? OK. Thank you, Christian. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. So <laughs> handing back over. OK, so got plenty of time in here. I know. So yeah. Video delivery and monetization. Thanks. Great. OK. So uh, next is video and monetization, and uh, that does. Have we got another another one after this as well, or is yeah. it the, yeah. and we have another one after this as well. Okay, so we've got uh, the games one, yeah. Games taking advantage of building games. No, the the one after this is um, basically how to build and then launch. How to build and launch. Okay, so. Stay with us for how to build and launch after this. Um. Okay. Okay. Thanks, guys. Um, 
So I'm going to talk about video and monetization, not necessarily uh, related. Uh, just uh, we decided to clump these in into this, this section of the talk. I'll first start with video. Uh, obviously, a Google TV device is a great device to deliver video to and make video uh, available on. Uh, so we get lots of questions on what sort of formats we support. Um, first, I want to sort of level set. I, I imagine most of you already know this, but um, I'm going to talk a little about uh, bit rates. Uh, so why, why do we want to worry about bit rates? Uh, especially, uh, you know, if you're an Android developer already or a mobile developer, why, why do we care uh, when it comes to the TV? Uh, well, a couple of things. One is that when you're on a mobile device, you are usually very bandwidth limited. Uh, you, uh, unless you're on Wi-Fi, if you're connected to the cellular network, you, you care about delivering video that is, yes, high quality on the mobile device, but that is also fast and playable while the user is on the go. Well, a Google TV device uh, typically isn't on the go. Uh, it's connected to the home network either over wireless over, or over a uh, hard line, over an Ethernet jack. Um, that said, uh, while you'll, you'll certainly likely get much better uh, bandwidth than a cellular connection, you do have to worry about um, the fact that residential uh, broadband varies wildly in uh, how good, uh, how, uh, how fast it is. And you have things like uh, uh, whether it's daytime or evening uh, changes the the sort of the, the bandwidth available to the user, and then low bandwidth content, the stuff that might look great on a phone on a three-inch screen looks terrible on a 60-inch display. So you really you really care about uh, the bit rate of the video you're serving, uh, and you want to test it. Make sure that you test your application. So we recommend that when you're serving video uh, and you in your application that you uh, test a variety of situations uh, where a user may have a uh, varying level of network connectivity. Uh, there's a, ver a variety of open source solutions that let you do this. Um, this one listed here, a mono wall uh, spelled with zeros instead of O's. Uh, but you, you typically want to test, uh, test a wide range, uh, you know, up to... Uh, 8 megabits or more, and then down to 1 megabit or down to 500. So, uh, I actually already talked about this. Uh, in choosing a bit rate, uh, what look, looks good on mobile doesn't look good on TV. Uh, you want high bit rate video. Um, there is constant bit rate, which is sort of the oldest way of encoding video. Uh, it's not really used in the real world. Uh, the worst case in this is that you're serving video that either always is choppy because the, the connection doesn't support it or isn't uh, high quality enough because there, there's more connection available and, and you're, not, you're not using it. There's variable bit rates. Uh, that is sort of the normal way of encoding video right now. Um, there's one single file. The video file itself varies the bit rate based on the content on the screen. Uh, that, you know, that's an important technology. That's not what, what we care about on Google TV, though. We care about uh, adaptive bit rate. So the difference here is that the bit rate of the video uh, varies depending on the network connectivity of the user. So adaptive bit rate streaming is made of, of several variable bit rate files and a descriptor. Um, this is what most modern video on-demand streaming uh, is, is comprised of. So the, the device itself will detect the network connection. Uh, video will start playing at, at typically the lowest uh, available bit rate. Of, uh, and then as uh, the network connect, uh, connection is tested and, and seen that uh, you can serve higher quality bit rates uh, and use more bandwidth, uh, higher quality bit, bit rate video will play. The other question we get a lot of is on DRM, digital rights management. Um, Google TV supports all the Honeycomb SD DRM framework. Uh, the only default provider we provide currently is for Widevine. Uh, Widevine supports adaptive bit rates, uh, MP4 files, uh, and it's an HTTP-based protocol. Uh, 
uh, if you have questions on, on Widevine or, or other DRM support, um, ask us after the, the session. We can talk about it. And then for encodings, uh, what is the recommended encoding? Well, it depends. Uh, if you're familiar with Android development, we support a superset of that. So we actually sp support more than what a Honeycomb tablet supports. Uh, we do have a list of formats that we support listed uh, at this URL. Uh, this, actually, I'll leave it up for a little bit more if you want to take a photo. Um, developers.google.com slash TV. And then you can actually, once you're there, search for our supported video formats. Uh, in general, most of our uh, of the video formats you're going to serve are going to be hardware decoded. So we actually have great decoding for uh, H.264. Um, we have some, uh, it depends on the device, some software, some hardware for VP6 and VP8. Uh, MPEG-2 is hardware decoded on Blu-ray players, uh, software decoded on uh, buddy boxes. Okay. Uh, so that, that's actually all I'm going to cover on, on video delivery, uh, except to say that we support a broad set of, of video delivery formats. Uh, so if you have it, we can probably support it. Um, and now I'm going to move on to sort of monetization and, and how do you make money. Uh, Google Play is the way to distribute your application on, on Google TV. Um, I'm sure you all are familiar with Google Play. It's formerly Android Market. Uh, it's basically a marketplace for compatible devices. Uh, and I said this in the, er in the earlier session, but there is one Google Play across mobile, tablet, and phone. Sorry, mobile, tablet, and TV. Uh, it is one marketplace. Uh, so if you upload an application to Google Play, it potentially can be available across all those devices or limited to a certain set of those devices, uh, depending on, on your choice as a developer. But it is one marketplace. There isn't a separate marketplace for TV. And then like you have with any Android device, Google Play on TV does not have a review period. Uh, so you can upload an application and it gets published out to your users immediately or um, published out to users immediately. And then if you update your application, users are uh, notified and can update uh, you know, with a within a very short time period, uh, basically the time it takes to propagate through our, our market back end. Uh, so, uh, you know, upload and get direct access to your users. You don't have to, to time your release uh, to uh, when, we, when we review. And then it's really easy to sort of build and deploy and publish on Google Play. Uh, you just develop your application using the Android SDK. Uh, there is no specific Google TV SDK. Uh, it is just the stock Android SDK. So you just build an Android application using some of the UI paradigms that, that Christian talked about in the earlier session. Uh, you register for a developer account, and then you publish. And it's immediately available on Play, on TV, or any other devices. The way that the platform, uh, all Android devices restrict uh, the applications that are available on them is there are a variety of ways. The most common is compatibility targeting. Uh, so I will build an application. I'm going to target a certain screen size, or I'm going to target devices that have GPS or devices that have an accelerometer. Um, the key feature for Google TV is that it does not have a touch screen. So Android Google Play assumes that any application that doesn't explicitly say, I don't require a touch screen, requires a touch screen. Uh, so the default, unless you say anything else, is that you require a touch screen in your application. Uh, so that's how the, the bulk of applications are actually filtered out of Google TV, because we really only want to deliver applications that are usable via the D-pad. Uh, while all Google TV uh, devices have a, a, a pointer, uh, let's see, there's a the mouse cursor. Um, it, it varies from the device. The type of pointing device varies from, from device to device. Uh, the, the, so this Sony remote has this sort of optical sensor, uh, which is it's great. It works very well. It's uh, almost impossible to click and drag with it, because you have to press down and sort of 
drag. Um, other devices have a, a touchpad. The new Sony remotes will have a touchpad. Uh, other remotes will have an accelerometer uh, to detect, uh, sorry, a, gy a gyroscope to detect the, where the user is pointing. Um, but these aren't all equivalent to a touch screen, right? None of these support multi-touch or anything like that. So that's the key sort of feature of Google TV is that we don't have a touch screen. That's, that's a key feature that you need to take into consideration when you develop and launch your app. You can target by you know business restrictions. Uh, so if you only want to make your available your app available in a certain country or to a certain language, you can certainly target that way. Uh, for mobile devices, you can target carriers as well. You can have one listing in market, but develop multiple applications. Uh, for instance, have one listing and, and then three applications in there. One custom built for. Uh, phone, one custom built for tablet, one custom built for TV, and then market will uh, serve those appropriate um, applications to those appropriate devices. Uh, there are a number of reasons why you might want to do this. Uh, it gives you one listing in market, so if a user is going to uh, Google Play on the web and wants to click install, uh, they'll see all their compatible devices there, uh, even though it might in fact be a, a separate piece of software that you wrote and then they can install directly to their TV or install directly to their phone. Um, you can build, you can obviously build one application that works on all d different devices, uh, but typically these applications will, uh, you'll have a lot of extra assets, they'll be larger because you have to support multiple screen densities, multiple screen sizes. And then you can restrict based on uh, device. So on a launch device, you can say, I don't want my application to be made available here. Typically, we don't recommend this unless you have a very specific reason to do so. Um, but uh, you know, we favor you restricting your application based on the capabilities that it requires. And then Google Play gives you stats on uh, where your app is downloaded, um, who's downloading the app, what languages they speak, uh, the screen sizes, the OS version. Uh, it does not typically give you a breakdown per device. Uh, we actually recommend that you always use some sort of analytics SDK to g gain more insight about your users and what they're doing in, their, in the application so that you can make it better. So uh, in publishing an application, you have obviously the ability to make it free. Uh, you have the ability to have a paid application. And then you have this model, which we call freemium, where you make an application available for free, but unlock additional content or additional features in the application through in-app purchasing. Um, we find the, the in-app purchasing, uh, some of those apps are the top grossing in, in, in Google Play. Uh, it is a great model for, for monetizing your application. Um, users are very comfortable with, with downloading an application for free. Uh, and then once they use and see the value of that application, they're very comfortable in paying for, for great content that you make available. And then if you do publish a free or, or any application, you can also uh, monetize through advertising. So in-app billing works in two different ways. Um, there are uh, what we call managed items or virtual goods uh, and unmanaged items or, or consum consumables. And the difference is pretty uh, simple. Managed items can only be purchased once. Uh, so it is some sort, of p some sort of content that, say, a user purchases and then you want to unlock on all Android devices or if the user reinstalls the application on a later date, you want to make sure they have this, uh, they have this purchase. So if, for instance, the, you're selling an upgrade to your application to make it a full version or you're selling a, a specific video, you want to use uh, managed items for in-app purchasing. And then applications can always ask the Google Play backend to replay all managed item purchases. And then there's unmanaged items, which, as you can guess, uh, can be purchased multiple times. Uh, you can't ask market for a, a playback of it, but this is, you know, if you're selling some sort of consumable good, if, you're, if, you're, if you have a game and in this game there are coins and you want to allow the user to purchase coins multiple times, uh, this is sort of the sort of thing that you would use unmanaged items for. So we've come a long way um, from launch of Android Market and Google Play and heard a lot of feedback from developers on how uh, you know, they really need to drive 
uh, users to their applications. They, they have problems with discovery. And we really want to drive more uh, users to great applications. So we continue to add more and more ways to highlight great applications on the platform and across Google Play, across all Android devices. Uh, so now we have things like staff picks, editor's choice, top developer badge. Um, if you go to play.google.com, you'll see these things uh, live today. Uh, if you go to market on Google TV, you'll see that we have two different ways of featuring applications. We have the hero banner, uh, where we highlight uh, very large featured images. Uh, it really draws the user's attention. And then we have what we call our staff picks for TV, uh, where, where users can always go in and see about 70 to 100 apps that we've highlighted for uh, for users that are great apps on TV. And then this list uh, varies from country to country. So we have an ability to target great apps that are only you know, available in Great Britain, for instance.